Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here and um, uh, appreciate for the uh, your attendance and apologize for the late start. I'm going to take a few minutes of our uh, guest speaker, uh, Jim Rutka's time to, to say a bit about uh, Sanjeev Bhatia and to introduce the lectureship. Um, for those who joined the department recently and don't know Sanjeev, he was a faculty here uh, at the university and one of our pediatric neurosurgeons. Uh, he was our first pediatric neurosurgery fellow in 2003. Um, that's after coming here to Miami, uh, fully trained at the All Institute, uh, All Indian Institute of Medicine um, and Neurosurgery, and then practicing at the Boston VA. Um, he was uh, he came to be a fellow with uh, Roberto and Jacques, uh, and then saw the light and became a pediatric neurosurgeon. Thankfully, um, he had special interest in, in tumors and in epilepsy, uh, and led led our division um, and sort of took over the epilepsy practice from Glenn. Uh, when Glenn retired. Um, we lost uh, Sanjeev in 2018, and we started this lectureship in his honor. And we're fortunate to have uh, Jim Rutka with us today. And before I say a bit about Jim, I'm just going to uh, highlight one of the accomplishments. I'm not sure whether I do it here. So, um, you know, many of you donated to the the NREF fund that we created in Sanjeev's memory and his honor. Um, and I want to thank you for that and, and provide an update. Um, as is typical of the NRAF funds, they have to reach $50,000 before they uh, can be used for their purpose. Um, and uh, through the generosity of the pediatric section and the American Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, they've matched that $50,000. So it's now a $100,000 endowment in the NRAF uh, and created a fellowship for one of the things that was near and dear to Sanjeev's heart. And that was um, helping uh, the, the community that doesn't have access to modern contemporary neurosurgery learn new techniques. So uh, he met many times over the years. And here's just a list of the folks that donated. And I want to thank you guys uh, specifically. Um, but this is this is the new Global uh, Neurosurgery Fellowship uh, in Sanchi's honor. It'll be funded every year to, uh, and it will go to um, a PG5 uh, PG55 resident or a fellow in neurosurgery interested in global neurosurgery and um, who will then be sponsored by a program anywhere in the world that has a formal relationship like the ones uh, that you would see with fiends. Um, and they will go and learn as much as I'm sure they'll teach. Uh, and it was announced this year at the pediatric section and it's already generated a fair amount of interest. So I want to thank everybody for that. Um, but on to the, the main act today, which is uh, our special guest, uh, Dr. Rutka. Uh, I, he barely needs an introduction, but I'm going to try to introduce him just the same. Um, we, we all get these emails, which I really love. Um, it, it helps focus my minimal uh, attention span on the important articles in the journal. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Rutka uh, just finished his time as uh, the chief of surgery at the University of Toronto. That's after si serving as the chief of neurosurgery and the chief at uh, Sick Kids. Um, he began his, he's from Toronto originally, right, and began his training um, uh, first at McGill as an intern after medical school, and then uh, at the university, and then a fellowship at SickKids, and then a neuro-oncology uh, and experimental pathology fellowship at UCSF, um, and then a clinical fellowship with Sugita, uh, which I'm sure was a, quite an experience as well as a lab experience. Uh, he's ha held nearly every important role uh, in neurosurgery, including president of the AANS, president of the World Federation, president of the Academy. Um, and I think what speaks mostly to the kind of man that Jim is, that he changed his plans when he saw the snowstorm coming uh, that was now all over Toronto and the Northeast. So he could come and arrive at 2 a.m. yesterday morning instead of a civilized flight in the afternoon. So he could be here today in person. So I can't thank Jim enough for being here and, and joining us. Um, I, I'm not sure why the, my emails that have Jim's editor's choice always contain an ad for Tampa General, but I'm, I hope there's a University of Miami ad that goes along with uh, that. And without uh, further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rutka. Thank you for being here. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Well, it's uh, never a hardship to come to Miami uh, from Canada in the wintertime. So the fact that I had to come early is good. Um, and spend an extra day with uh, friends and colleagues. So get myself um, set up here, have Iggy in the background there to help um, in case we have a, an issue. So hopefully it should be setting up here. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, um, 
I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here for the, the Sanjeev Bhatia lecture, the fourth one. And uh, today, I'm, I'm particularly honored that uh, Rita and Shoban would be here. So Sanjeev's uh, wife and uh, son, and we had dinner last night together. It was fantastic to hear some great stories about Sanjeev over the years. And I knew Sanjeev very well, actually. And I always uh, looked forward to the times that we would interact at meetings in particular, but also by email and by phone and uh, other um, ways uh, for, for many, many years. Uh, he was a remarkable individual. I'll be saying a little bit more um, about him. But so this lecture is actually dedicated to Sanjeev and uh, his memory. And John already showed this image. I, I love this image, especially the picture of uh, Sanjeev reading. And last night at dinner, I heard from Rita that uh, Sanjeev ordered books like crazy from Amazon and would. <laughs> so there's a big pile of books at home where he would go through them one by one, underlining with a pencil the important parts of these uh, books and, and journals and manuscripts that he would he would read. And he was a true academic in, in the sense of the word. And John wrote this wonderful piece, a tribute to Sanjeev that's here that was published in Child's Nervous System. So again, thank you, John. It was uh, real wonderful to be here. And you know, Sanjeev has a lasting legacy. You heard about the NREF fund just now from John, but also his publications over many years. And as, as mentioned, um, Sanjeev was great about uh, studying hydrocephalus and tumors and um, epilepsy in particular. And uh, one of my colleagues, George Ibrahim, who's now on staff with us at the University of Toronto in neurosurgery, trained here in Miami and spoke at length about his interactions with uh, Sanjeev and his family and also how much he learned in the process of working with Sanjeev. But uh, today's topic is about journal publications. So one of Sanjeev's lasting legacies is this, is his publications in the literature. And I've selected a few for you to see. And uh, the topics vary from hydrocephalus to epilepsy and so on. And actually, many of them have joint uh, publication names with colleagues of mine from the University of Toronto. So Sanjeev was interconnected across uh, the globe for the work that he did. Uh, it's been many years since I've been to the University of Miami, but great to see uh, colleagues and friends again on the adult side. So Alan, thank you. Nice to, <laughs> nice to see a fellow uh, Canadian here. And uh, of course, Roberto, uh, whom I haven't seen for quite some time. Roberto, lovely to see you and other friends uh, that I've known for many, many years. And on the pediatric side, I'll be speaking tomorrow at the Children's Hospital, so I'll be happy to uh, uh, you know, see my colleagues there and uh, visit the institution, which I don't think I've seen uh, before. So this is the title of the talk today, and it's a little rhetorical, obviously, and um, because I strongly believe that we must keep the, the journals going. But I thought I would present this to you because the world is changing, and the way in which we're looking at the literature, the way that we look at uh, journals and uh, and academic contributions, it's all changing for us. So the overview is listed there. I'll describe for you some of the neurosurgical journals um, and their roles. Um, I'll be talking mostly about the journal neurosurgery, which I'm editor-in-chief of, recent trends in publishing, and uh, some future predictions. And um, we'll see where that takes us. My disclosure is you know, I'm editor of this one journal, and so I'm biased, obviously. And so some of what you'll hear today is going to come from my viewpoint as editor of uh, the Journal of Neurosurgery Publishing Group. But this is uh, the reason why I brought this forward uh, today, and that is um, there's, a, there's a revolution you know about, and it's taken place in the last 30 years, and it's digital. And so to think about holding journals in your hand now and leafing through them page by page is uh, a bit of an anachronism. And uh, Victor Liu picked me up from the airport and I asked him, he resident in your program, if he ever reads the journals. And he says, no, I never leaf through the, the print journal anymore. It's all online. So uh, it's changing. And uh, print journals, I predict, are going to go away within the next uh, 20 to 30 years. On the right-hand side of this slide, what you can see is the number of times individuals around the world, 2.4 billion people are connected to the internet. And look what they're doing on the internet, you know, um, Yelp, Skype, Vine, Pinterest, YouTube. I mean, there's a lot of activity, um, less uh, so for like email, um, scouring uh, the, the literature and things like that. Um, but you can, you can certainly do all of that um, in your daily activities. Uh, Roberto and I remember the days when there were libraries, right? You'd walk into a building that had books in it and you'd go to the stacks, you'd pick up a book and you would photocopy it and you'd study, you'd underline things. Uh, probably very few of the residents these days may not, they may not even know where the University of Miami library is, but you don't have to because you can search the library on your computer 
And this is the University of Toronto Libraries. And I've just uh, punched in their Journal of Neurosurgery, and I could do a search for that. And you could see all the issues of the Journal of Neurosurgery back to 1944. And you can you can look at them. But the University of Toronto has one of the world's best library systems that's all digital. And you can look at the entire collection that they have. And there's some 40,000 academic journals now that are available for your review. Um, University of Toronto has about 30,000. So it's one of the world's best uh, libraries. I'm not sure what the University of Miami looks like, um, but a lot of uh, you know institutions nowadays will uh, put all their money into getting uh, digital content on their library site so that you don't have to go to the library in person these days uh, for almost anything nowadays. Uh, these are some of the main neurosurgical journals that I share with you. You can see the general neurosurgery journals at the top. Um, I'm not listing journals that are like um, association journals necessarily or country journals like the British uh, Journal of Neurosurgery or the Korean uh, Journal of Neurosurgery and so on. But these are some of the the major ones that you can see and you can um, take a look at here, spine journals, cerebral vascular, functional, peripheral nerve trauma journals. Uh, there are a lot of journals out there that you can submit your work to. So you have a lot of choices. And <clears throat> if you're like me, you've had a lot of rejection letters over the years. So if your paper gets rejected, the good news is you have a lot of choices. You can submit to somewhere else. And it's very likely that your paper is going to be published in the literature because of all the choices uh, that you have. But why even bother? Like, wh why is it important to think about publishing in the literature? And I'll, I'm not going to read this to you because it's, it's an important statement. And the scientific enterprise is built on a foundation of trust. Society trusts that scientific research results are an honest and accurate reflection of a researcher's work. Researchers equally trust that their colleagues have gathered data carefully have used appropriate analytic and statistical techniques, have reported their results accurately, and have treated the work of other researchers with respect. So that's why we publish our work in the literature and an extremely important statement that you should be aware of. <clears throat> but what's the value of publishing in neurosurgery journals? Uh, lessons from the past. As you get older, you realize that almost nothing is new under the sun and things that you think you are... Um, describing for the first time have probably been thought of at least and, and most likely published in the past. So, you know, you can scroll through uh, the Journal of Neurosurgery. It's archived back to the first issue, which is 1944 when the journal first began. And here's a publication from that first issue. And it's by Horax on some of Harvey Cushing's contributions to neurological surgery. So this is the crossbow incision for the residents in the audience that Harvey Cushing used to get wide exposure of the posterior fossa for operating on, on tumors and the like. <clears throat> but um, some of you may have used this incision. And this is one that, um, that Cushing used on, on numerous occasions in the work that he did uh, as he was embarking on his career. Another reason um, to think about the value is because of collections that uh, journals can link to. And of course, uh, revered here in the state of Florida, uh, Al Roton across the world for his work in neuroanatomy and our linkages with journals like the Journal of Neurosurgery and the Roton Collection. So you can click on an icon that occurs in the Journal of Neurosurgery and I'll take you directly to the source for the Roton Collection and the very important neuroanatomical neuro specimens that Roton used to describe his work. Another thing where I think it's really important for journal publishing is the levels of evidence. And you can't get levels of ed evidence from an internet scrolling of, um, of work that's not been published by peer review. I mean, you can get information, but it won't be giving you that a very important level of evidence that you need to know how valid that work is in, in our world as neurosurgeons. So level, levels of evidence are listed here, and you can see them. Oh, yeah, my pointer is showing. It's great. So you can see the levels of evidence from one to five here with where four and five are like case reports and randomized trials are the, the highest level of evidence. And we uh, underscore these now in the Journal of Neurosurgery as levels of evidence that you can attach yourselves to to know how valid the research work is. Okay, another reason um, <clears throat> there's value to publications is because of timely publication of opinion pieces. And uh, these days, we can, we can rapidly publish um, articles that have meaning to society and to our world as neurosurgeons. 
And in the journal of neurosurgery, we have this area called Broca's area, which is for the um, opinion pieces uh, such as these. So here's Leland Albright, a famous pediatric neurosurgeon. And he went to Kenya and he worked for seven years in this small um, village hospital where he did amazing cases of pediatric neurosurgery. And he wrote about his experience there for seven years, uh, working almost in isolation, doing big cases like this, like cranial pharyngioma and, uh, you know, kyphectomies for spina bifida cases and things like that. And this is uh, with a, a barely functioning uh, microscope and a very poor endoscope. And he did this fantastic uh, work while he was um, in Kenya all these years. So we we wrote about this. And uh, just, just so you know, from the time that your paper is accepted in the journal Neurosurgery to Publication is 30 days. So the timeline's gotten shorter and shorter. It used to be that uh, you'd have to wait six to nine months before you would see your article published in press. You still have to wait for press, but the online publication and, and makes it accessible for all of you is within 30 days of acceptance of your journal, which I think is actually pretty good these days. <clears throat> okay, open access uh, opens neurosurgery to the world. And Marty Weiss, you may remember him, he was the former chair of neurosurgery at the University of Southern California. He and John Jane Sr. started uh, Neurosurgical Focus before I became editor-in-chief around 1996. And now Dr. Caldwell from um, University of Utah is the editor of uh, Neurosurgery Focus. But it was the first clinical neurosurgery journal that was open access, meaning free, available to the world, no cost to it. It was an extraordinary you know, I think wise move for um, the journal to get involved in open access publishing like this. And um, many of the scientific journals were just starting to be open access at that time, but this was the first, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first clinical journals to be open access uh, to the world. Uh, journals should not be static. If they're going to be relevant for all of you, they should not be static. So the first issue of the journal of neurosurgery is seen here in 1944, a pretty plain cover, and now uh, it's changed a lot. I think you'll agree. I'm very proud of the covers that we have for the journal of neurosurgery. Maybe some of you in the room have had cover figures published on the journal, but uh, it's like uh, being on the cover of the Rolling Stone, right? So to be on the cover of Journal Neural Surgery is, is very important. Uh, again, not static. Uh, we've celebrated in recent times our 75th anniversary. Uh, we have now these online only journals like Focus and Case Lessons, and then we have the print journals that are located here. And we have video journals now. So I think for this group of residents and fellows in the room, uh, the video journals hold a lot of appeal and attraction because you're thinking about a case you want to do the night before you scour the internet you find a video on that particular approach you study it and you're all set to go the next day so i think that's very valuable for all of you as uh, as trainees in in neurosurgery there are also multimedia platforms uh, that we take advantage of so um here you can see linkages to other things like the Atlas, Neurosurgical Atlas, um, Journal Club, article spotlights with videos that are embedded. So all these things are fairly new to the world of uh, clinical journal publishing. Uh, timely responsiveness to world events. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, struck all of us very hard in, in a variety of different ways. It had an impact on neurosurgery. There's no question about that. And I must tell you that I've never worked harder, I, I think, in my entire life than I did during the pandemic with the journal because neurosurgeons were unable to do their clinical work. Everything was kind of closed down. But being neurosurgeons, they did all of their academic work. And so all of the manuscripts that were sitting on their desks were polished off, sent to the journal. And there were days in my office where I'd look online at my box, inbox, for numbers of manuscripts to start to to go through and to triage and so on there were more than 75 on any given day 75 manuscripts a day that i was dealing with to to deal with this uh, sudden influx of uh, papers coming to the journal on average now things have gone back it's about 15 to 20 a day but it was it was really difficult back in those days and that was because of the pandemic no question and we published a neurosurgical focus issue on on uh, how the pandemic impacted our practices in neurosurgery. If you do a, a, a PubMed query now in February on the number of papers published on COVID-19, it's uh, 377,000 roughly. And of those, about 3,000 uh, relate to neurosurgery. So this is, since the pandemic, a whole new literature has been spawned as a result. And uh, you can 
see the impact of, um, of something like a pandemic on neurosurgery. Uh, Aaron Cohen's a good friend. Uh, can I just see a show of hands from residents? Who looks at the neurosurgical atlas? Everybody. Okay, so it's really, it's become the vehicle of knowledge for a lot of you, right? So our journal relates to um, the neurosurgical atlas. You can go back and forth. You can click on linkages in the journal and you can take you directly to Aaron's site. Similarly, you can go to Aaron's site, click on linkages. It'll take you to the journal of neurosurgery. So they're back and forth exchanges. So uh, I think what he ha has done has been uh, truly masterful and it's been a great teaching tool for um, all of uh, neurosurgery. Hyperlinks I've already mentioned with uh, linkages to videos, um, other articles uh, in the literature, uh, bi-directional hyperlinks to other sites, uh, consolidating materials, open access content as with neurosurgical focus, um, materials, fully annotated case examples, um, all these things um, are very important and expand the scope of journals uh, these days. Uh, we've moved into social media, and so this is how um, you, can, you can have impact as well, is to get your word out there, as, as I know many of you are, are fully aware. And so we have a team of uh, social media um, residents and medical students who are helping us get the word out there for the Journal of Neurosurgery. And uh, thankfully, <clears throat> uh, we have, um, I, I do some myself, uh, so I, I post stuff myself on on these platforms, but we have a team that also does uh, their own work. So that the traditional social media platforms, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter, as shown here, uh, there'll be other platforms in the future. There's no doubt about that. But this is our team. So these are young individuals who know how to, to do these things extremely well, way better than than I do or that that we do in the in the office of the journal. So we've been empowered them to post our our uh, work in the journal. And it's been it's been a great success. And if you look at the metrics on social media for postings, uh, the Journal of Neurosurgery has traditionally been at the top for getting the word out there and having the highest uh, click rates and uh, and also uh, reader rates um, around the world. So it's it's been great to be linked into social media. Okay, with journals, there can be journal clubs. So another reason to have a journal is to think about journal clubs. And Bill Caldwell runs our journal club. Um, and here's one on pineal region tumors, which was uh, very well regarded, and this one on stroke and others. So th these happen, I think, every three to four weeks, and you can keep your eyes open, and maybe some of you have attended these. They're also video recorded, and they're posted. So if you don't have time to watch it on the day, you can watch it some other time. And we started a new journal. This one's called the Journal of Neurosurgery Case Lessons, and this is for the residents and fellows in the audience in particular you know, it's really hard to publish case reports nowadays. In the main journals, uh, almost always uh, you, you get a rejection letter. So we thought there was a need to allow uh, residents and fellows to publish their ideas for cases to get accustomed to putting a manuscript together with all that that entails, which is a, a substantial undertaking. And uh, the success rate for publishing in journal neurosurgery case lessons is, is high. It's like 80, 90 percent. So uh, if you have a, a case report that you think is interesting, and there are always case, cases that we learn from in neurosurgery, think about submitting your work to uh, the Journal of Neurosurgery uh, Case Lessons. Uh, Carl Heilman uh, from Tufts is the editor-in-chief of Case Lessons for us. Uh, Doug Konziolka was uh, my associate editor. He's now moved on, as you know, to be the editor of neurosurgery. But he and I worked really closely together for around seven years, and uh, we uh, did a lot of uh, publishing of editorials together. This one on how to publish the best studies in neurosurgery. And this takes me to peer review, which is uh, a necessary component of journal publishing. And the schema that you see here is on how manuscripts come into the office and how they're distributed and reviewed and scored. And a decision is rendered at the bottom. Um, Peer review is not perfect, but it's probably the best that we have at this time. It allows for diversity of opinions without bias. Re reviewers are typically, they should be experts in the field. Uh, this enables authors to revise and improve their studies towards publication. So I would say that most of the time, the articles that come into the journal after they've been peer reviewed and sent back for revision, when they come back again for acceptance, they're much better papers than what they were coming in the door. Not always, but but I would say the vast majority of times. Sure. So the Alan asked a very important question about 
simultaneous review versus sequential review. Simultaneous meaning that an editor sends the articles to, let's say, five different reviewers at the same time, and the five reviewers write their reviews and send it back to the editor. Sequential means that um, you have, let's say, five reviewers, but it's sent primary, secondary, tertiary uh, reviewers in sequence. So one after another. And then in the se sequential mode of review, which is the Journal of Neurosurgery's uh, pattern of review, um, the reviewers get to see each other's comments along the way. So as you cascade down from the primary to the quaternary reviewer, uh, the quaternary reviewer gets to see everybody's comments before making a decision about that. So that's um, what's called sequential. And as far as I know, it may be one of the only journals in the world that does sequential review. And it stands out as being unique that way and different. Um, and, and at the same time, could be problematic. You can imagine that if the fourth reviewer gets to see the first three reviewers' comments, maybe swayed or biased towards those earlier comments, and then won't get a, a fair independent review, possibly. Um, so so that's that's the critical point about um, sequential versus simultaneous review. Okay, so Roberto. <laughs> Sequential review may or may not be the fairest, but I can tell you that it is a tremendous learning experience for people on the editorial board because you read the other, you know, the experts' comments and uh, learn a lot from that. So, in my two, two sequences of the two, two tries at the editorial board, I get to show you one of the twice. I learned so much from looking at the previous reviewers. Yeah. And, and I would say that's a that's a very common statement by the reviewers on the editorial board. Once they finish their term, and it's a short term for neuro, well, a journal, it's like five years. And once you're done, they all say, boy, did I ever learn a lot from the experience? Am I now a better reviewer? Can I write my articles better? Because I just see what's required to be. And there are a lot of smart uh, reviewers on the editorial board of, of Journal Neurosurgeon. Just as Roberto said, you can learn from all of them. Uh, by the way, Roberto spent two terms on the editorial board journal, and he still holds the, the world record for most number of reviews for the Journal of Neurosurgery, which is staggering. It's like 2,500 or close to 3,000, something like that, some stag. But Locke McDonald is catching up to you, I can tell you. Locke McDonald, who's off the editorial board but is still reviewing for us, is, is catching up. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question, Alan. And and But, you know, but bias is the key, right? Can you mitigate your bias in a sequential review process? And as you ask the editorial board members of the journal, they'll say they can manage their biases. You may not agree with that, but they say, I don't, I don't even look at the prior reviewers' comments. I can if I want to. And sometimes if I don't know this field well, I will. Or if I really want to understand what, let's say, Fred Barker says about this, I can see what Fred Barker said, and I can learn from that. So it's, it's a, I think it's an open question right now. But it's it's a very important one that the residents should know about that, for example, other neurosurgical journals will send it out for simultaneous review. But as this schema here shows, this is sequential. So one, two, three, four, you can see across the top, comes back to us. We render an opinion. It's either accepted or rejected. So that's the whole key about that. So thanks, uh, Alan, and thanks, Roberto, for those comments. Uh, some disadvantages for peer review in general, um, sequential or, or simultaneous. Uh, papers can be judged on the reputations of authors. Um, I know some journals double blind, meaning that the, um, the the author's names are stripped from the journal and the reviewers don't know uh, necessarily who's written the paper. You can you can do that for sure in many, many cases, but there are some situations where you know where the manuscript is coming from. All right. 4,000 cavernomas of the brainstem. There's probably one institution. Well, maybe a few in China now, but one institution in North America where you're going to see those, and that's um, uh, well known to all of you. But but uh, peer review can be time consuming and expensive. The final decisions are in the hands of the editor. Manuscripts may be judged by the country of origin, conflicts of interest, fraud is difficult to detect. Reviewers are so busy they can't necessarily do a screen for fraud of uh, you know scientific, scientific integrity. Uh, grading systems of the peer review process are rare, so we don't give great feedback back to our reviewers. And But you need to know that reviewers are doing this pro bono. They're not getting paid to do the reviews. And I've done, like Roberto, I've done thousands of reviews in my lifetime. It's for the greater good. That's what pro bono means. You're doing it because it's it's the right thing to do at the right time. 
but uh, people are busy and they may not have the time to you know thoroughly review a manuscript so these are some of the problems of of peer review it'll change and i'll get to this uh, later as we move into things like peer review you know decades from now so um, there are ways to try to improve upon uh, peer review this is a, a group that's called Publons, and there are over 3 million researchers that are now involved in this, uh, this website. And um, it tracks your publications, your, your metrics. Um, it has a CV, and it can be shared with editors around the world. And editors can select from this group to find a reviewer who is perfectly matched for this article that comes to the journal. So that might be a solution for the future. This is a dashboard you would get as a reviewer to know how, how good your reviews are, how thorough, how many you've done, and so on. So something like that might be a, um, an improvement to the peer review process. So other solutions for peer review, because the whole process of publication in journals like the Journal of Neurosurgery depends on, on the peer review process. Artificial intelligence, uh, you're all tired of hearing about this AI and machine learning business, but um, maybe that will help us find reviewers that don't have so much uh, in the way of bias. Increasing diversity of editorial board members is extremely important. I have another slide I'll, I'll talk to about that. Improving systems for scientific misconduct detection. Increasing recognition of editorial board members and peer reviewers. I've tried as editor of the journal to do that, to recognize our board members as best as possible for all the work that they do because they're extremely busy and they do a great, a great job for us. There might be post-publication peer review in the future. That means that, you know, send your article in. It will be published right away. But after it gets published, that's when the peer review comments will come out, right? That would be an interesting twist on the situation. Early statistical methods review um, would be very important, I think, for a lot of journals, just to know whether uh, it should be sent out for peer review because the statistics were, were good uh, at the outset. Uh, some of you may know about these preprint servers in neurosurgical publications. They all have the um, the name archive at the end, so archive, bio archive, socio archive, chem archive, and so on. Uh, you can publish your work like instantly on these preprint servers, and no questions asked. You just get it in there, and it's it's up there, and you get a a PubMed ID associated with that. And if you look at a bio archive, which is where most of the neurosurgery preprint um, submissions would come, there have been about 4,000 already submitted in recent times. And this one's, for example, on epigenetics of um, DNA methylation in neurosurgery patients. Uh, so these are published um, without peer review. Uh, but if you want to take it now and publish from the, these uh, preprint servers to a journal like the Journal of Neurosurgery, it will go through peer review. Um, and you have to acknowledge that you've already published it on a preprint server, and that's okay. Uh, we're, we're fine with that process. So uh, this is becoming more common, and it's really important for the basic sciences like, like chemistry and physics and so on. They want to get their stuff you know, out the door and published like right away. But you can imagine some of the circumstances where that might fail and where there may be problems because it's not peer-reviewed, and anything can be put out there um, as an example. Okay, so what's the role of the editor in chief in all of this? And I'll just leave this on the on the screen for a second, and I'll, I'll ask the residents if they can recognize any of these <laughs> individuals, with the exception of me. I hope they can recognize me up there. But um, the others, right? I'll just um, so Henry Schwartz was the uh, the um, from uh, Washington University. Uh, John Jane Senior, who just recently passed. Louise Eisenhardt was the first um, editor um, in chief of the journal. Uh, Thor Sunt, uh, Bill Collins, Henry Heil, and uh, myself. So there have been seven of us over the years. And um, I've, I've really enjoyed this um, over the last uh, you know nine years now. I plan to do this for about another three years, for 12 years total. Um, and I, I, I've, been, I've enjoyed being trained at first by John Jane Sr., who's shown here. He was a great editor-in-chief and uh, had a marvelous contributions uh, to the Journal of Neurosurgery. So I was mentored by him to, to take over in the role. Uh, but we, as editors, have a chance to get our, our name out there, on, on in, again, on these types of opinion pieces. This one on the pitfalls in the practice of neurosurgery. And uh, this is a, a recent editorial on uh, ways in which uh, we, as uh, neurosurgeons who are just starting our careers, can fail and uh, things like uh, personality problems, substance abuse, financial motivations, um, lack of peer review amongst your colleagues, stress and burnout, 
are all ways that you can crash and burn as neurosurgeons if you're not careful. So hopefully that was a timely message uh, to neurosurgeons um, in the group. Uh, John showed this at the beginning, editor's choice. These are all freely available, open access. So you can click on those and get all the, uh, and download the PDFs as you wish. Um, and I put those out uh, about monthly. Um, you know, I think it's a good process for us. But it's a role that uh, very few people talk about anymore uh, of being editor. So the editor should have a strong um, ability to filter, select, refine, and finalize. Uh, needs leadership that connects with uh, people around uh, the world. Uh, editor should provide a vision for where a publication is going. And a good editor will be at the forefront of handling misconduct issues, which I'll, I'll come to in a moment. And, you know, I, my day-by-day -day work in the journal is... is quite extensive and also timely takes a lot of my time but when i get a misconduct um episode coming to me like uh, a manuscript where uh, misconduct has been the question of it has been raised it stops me in my tracks it takes hours to deal with these so you have to be very careful dealing with these misconduct issues and there these are the main types of scientific misconduct so you may be aware of fabrication falsification plagiarism and uh, ethical violations Fabrication is the making up of data uh, and reporting them in the literature. So for an example, a study coordinator completes a trial enrollment and using fake names and participant information. Um, a researcher imagines how the data should look to prove a hypothesis and writes a paper on an imaginary experiment. Those are just some egregious examples. But here's an individual, Eric Pullman, a human obesity researcher who published over 200 journal articles. And he admitted that 10 of his papers were based on fictitious data. But he had you know, grants from the NIH at you know over th almost $3 million, and he was sentenced to prison for inventing data on a grant application. So here's uh, Yoshitaka Fuji, who was uh, called the biggest fabricator in science and how he got uh, caught as an investigator. He's an anesthesiologist from Japan. Uh, he began falsifying his data in 1993. He, he studied this drug, um, granisetron, in post-operative period. And his data, when somebody looked at it, like a, a statistician looked at it, it was just too perfect. Like it was ordered so perfectly, it could not be like, you know, randomly distributed data. So um, he didn't have consent forms and it was determined that 126 of his papers were totally fabricated. So as if someone was sitting at a desk and wrote a novel about a research idea. So falsification is the manipulation of research materials, equipment, or processes, or changing or omitting data such that the research is not accurately represented in the research. So manipulating um, graphs, blots, um, contrast imaging on an MRI scan or something, and uh, falsifying that information for publication purposes. And here's a veterinarian from Seoul National. Some of you may remember when this hit the press, he alleged to have created human, human embryonic stem cells according to this technique. Um, it was found that this was uh, false and uh, he was expelled from the university. And plagiarism. Plagiarism is the appropriation of another person's ideas, results, or words without giving appropriate credit, uh, presenting the data or interpretations of others without crediting them and thereby gaining for yourself. So. We don't know what the incidence of this is in the, in the world, but it's probably high and it, and it could become higher, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, a range of estimates in the literature. I've seen uh, numbers as high as 30%, like some stuff is plagiarized. Um, based on plagiarism, you'll see retractions in journals like Retraction Watch, and I'll, um, I'll talk about that uh, subsequently. Okay, so enter chat GPT. So who's uh, heard about this? <laughs> a it's a large language model that responds to messages using patterns learned from trained materials. Uh, so you present an instructional phrase and you ask the language model for a response. Has anyone used it here in the room? Okay, what, did, what question did you ask? And I, what, what instructional phrase did you want to find the answer to? Okay, so so for anatomical studies, you can think about asking a question related to you know write an write an editorial on this for me. What what comes out in response to a question like that? So here, look at this. Write a systematic review in one hour with Chat GPT. You know how long it is to write a systematic review. Do it in an hour now with Chat GPT. 
Now letters to the editor, editorials, scientific articles, systematic reviews, meta-analyses can all possibly be done by chat GPT. So here's, here's an example. The instructional phrase is, write a letter to the editor advocating for prenatal closure of myelomeningocele. So this was fed into the language model, and this is what came back in response. Dear editor, I am writing to express my strong support for prenatal closure of uh, myelomeningocele, a type of spinal cord defect that can cause serious physical and cognitive disabilities. Uh, you can read the rest there. And then it also said this, overwhelming evidence to suggest that prenatal closure of myelomeningocele can significantly improve outcomes for affected infants and families. So it's actually pretty good. This one came back pretty good. And so then we asked it the contrary, which is, write a letter to the editor advocating against prenatal closure. So for and against. So what did ChatGPT say? ChatGPT said, dear editor, first, prenatal closure of M MMC is a high risk procedure that can result in complications for both mother and baby. It's higher rate of miscarriage and premature birth compared to other forms of fetal surgery. Um, mother is bedridden for several weeks, which can be physically and emotionally challenging. In conclusion, I strongly urge medical professionals and policymakers to reconsider the use of this and so on. Not bad. Just came back in a second, one second response. Um, pretty phenomenal. So, uh, <laughs> so the analysis of that, I mean, when you looked carefully at what was just what I just presented to you, the quality of the writing was good, depth of understanding greater than that of a lay person for sure. Understanding of the literature was okay, lacking citations, included many salient arguments for and against. Its analysis lacked the depth and nuance that you know we would expect for doing high level research. Responses were worded in simple language, for example, backbone instead of spinal column and so on. Obvious that that was written by um, somebody who was not a medical professional or scientist, but it's reasonably good, um, all things considered. So who is the one that uses this stuff? All, put their hands up, all who's you chat GBT, all of them, right? They all were doing it. Yeah. It, you watched, I mean, the world is changing and that's why we, okay. So I don't know if you played this game, uh, this is an old game, it's a word game in 1975. So just preface this by saying, when I was in university in 1975, so 40 plus years ago, this was the word game. A father and his five-year-old son are involved in a car accident in which the father suffers a severe traumatic brain injury, and the son has a right-blown pupil, left hemiparesis. The son is taken by ambulance to a nearby trauma center, and a CT scan shows a right epidural hematoma. The neurosurgeon on call walks into the, into the emergency room, sees and examines the child and says, I cannot operate on this child. This child is my son. In 1975, I could not get the answer to that question. 1975. Today, I'm hoping all of you know the answer to this scenario, right? That so it, this, the father is in the you know, accident, GCS5, he can't respond, obviously. But now this person comes in and says, this child is my son. Well, obviously, now I can say... <laughs> It's because um, the neurosurgeon's a woman. It's his mother who did the, the surgery. So asking chat GPT now, trying to trick GPT about gender bias in neurosurgery, tell me a story about a neurosurgeon, no gender specified, who is able to save a patient's life. And I should say that that no gender specified it was not there in the original question. It was, tell me a story about a neurosurgeon who is able to save a patient's life. And this is what ChatGPT came back with. Once upon a time, there was a neurosurgeon named Dr. Sarah. She was known for her exceptional skills in performing complex brain surgeries. One day, a patient named Jack was brought to the hospital with a life-threatening brain tumor. The medical team was in a dilemma as the tumor was located in a critical area. Dr. Sarah examined the scans and consulted her team. They concluded that the only way to save Jack's life was to perform risky surgery. Dr. Sarah accepted the case and went ahead with surgery, and it was a great outcome. So... It, it got the notion that, you know, neurosurgeons can be women, right? It kind of went in there and named Dr. Sarah. I'm seeing some thumbs up there from the women in the, in the back. <laughs> so there you go. So ChatGPT um, has been informed, right? Knows some of the issues that are in the popular press these days about uh, gender biases, unconscious biases that we all have. Okay, so we're just going to wrap things up. And uh, these are uh, the 10 
uh, top most, you know, the retraction watch is an organization that looks for um, articles that are retracted. So since I've been editor in chief, we've had a few, not many articles that we've had to retract because there's been misconduct or issues found with the data. But here's an example of one that was published in the New England Journal. It had huge impact. Like um, before the retraction, it was already cited 1900 times. Um, and so you can imagine the damage that something like that can do in the, uh, the literature and then it's retracted. Uh, there's something called the Center for Open Science, which allows you to store warehouse your, your work in this big uh, digital repository, which I think is probably gonna be the wave of the future for scientists to get their stuff into a, a pre-publication uh, mode and, and to have it accessible to the world so that everybody can comment on it in real time. And, and there's the website for the Center for Open Science. Um, there's also the Committee on Publication Ethics, which promotes integrity and scholarly research and its publications. And uh, many of the things that they do are listed on the right-hand side here. Um, so they keep a, an eye out on what's um, important in uh, publishing and making sure that standards are maintained for journals, especially uh, today's talk for the neurosurgical journals. Uh, I talk about, about equity in neurosurgical scientific publication. So with uh, Bill Ashley and Sonia Eden, uh, we put together this um, idea for how journals can do better for achieving equity in neurosurgical publications, creating these committees, which we've done now, that will look at um, articles that talk about uh, disparities in either socioeconomics or, or gender or race, uh, gathering uh, data all the while and creating a framework uh, for us to use um, to make sure that articles will not be given low ratings or grades or marks on the basis of, of inappropriate understanding of the importance of equity in our field. So some of the scholarly publishing trends to watch for in the future include machine learning and artificial intelligence. I, I showed you this latest um, approach using chat GPT as one example. Interoperable metadata, this means taking uh, meta-analyses from all over and incorporating them together into one you know, large uh, body of work. Open access publishing models and standards um, will become more and more important in, in Europe, for example, now. Open access is becoming the only way to publish your work in, in science. Likely that will uh, percolate over here to North America before too long. Advancements in alternate uh, research methods, increased use of preprint servers, which I talked about, a, mo a move towards publication in open science formats and real-time interaction with the authors. So you go back and forth with the authors as reviewers until you're satisfied in real time. Like, You'd be video chatting with each other about an article, for example, and uh, before you accept it into the journal. You can be sure it'll be multi-platform, multi-formatted, hyperlink, single click, and all available on your handheld personal device so that the days of the journals, which I started um, talking about at the beginning, where you, you flip through a, a print journal page, uh, probably those days are going to be over before too long. Just a word about open access publishing. It increases the visibility of your paper. It's um, your paper will more likely be accessed, read, and downloaded because it's free to the world, um, but and time to publication may be shorter. Authors, by virtue of paying the fee for um, open access, retain the copyright. Has anyone here published open access? So how much were you charged? Can I ask how much? What, what was the fee? Do you remember how much you had to pay? Maybe you didn't have to pay that you know. But it can be anywhere from a thousand to like five, up to ten thousand dollars to publish your own work. I mean, it's your, you get the copyright for it. But to, in my view, it, um, it's a scam. Like I think the open access publishing fee rate is a scam, and I don't know how it was set up, but journals are making a lot of money on that. And so, when I see the rates at three to ten thousand, they're, I think they're out a window for really what open access should be achieving. And the, and it's the publishing firms and companies that are making all the profit for that. Okay, disadvantages. I mentioned the cost can be high. Uh, quality of some open access journals is low, so-called predatory journals. So be careful about you know being invited to contribute to this journal and then seeing a fee for $5,000 you have to pay and then having it as a predatory journal that's never going to be quoted or where its impact factor is extremely low. So just be careful about, about those things. Okay, and then um, just to wrap it up on the importance. So I started out, are these journal, are journals still necessary? 
I think so, because your work will be cited by others, uh, potentially influencing the future of generations of neurosurgeons and patients. So I, I started the, the presentation talking about Sanjeev uh, Bhatia's publications, and his works have been cited uh, as a lasting legacy um, of, of his work in neurosurgery. Most academic institutions rely on peer-reviewed publications as fundamental criteria for promotion. So if you're at a university and you want to be promoted in the system, they're going to count the number of peer-reviewed uh, journal articles that you have. Your observations, procedure techniques may influence the practice of neurosurgery. That's, that's pretty significant when you think about it, that something that you dreamt of or thought about and you published has now influenced the way that neurosurgery will be conducted in the future. That's, that's a major goal, I think, that we all uh, strive for. Uh, your publication in a peer-reviewed journal may influence your ability to receive um, research grant funding. So you know that if you're applying to the NIH, other agencies, um, they're going to look at your publication record, but the work that is directly related to the research that you're submitting is going to be judged by the peer-reviewed panel. And based on that, you'll have a higher or less likely chance of getting funding from agencies like the NIH. I think uh, the future is that... Uh, uh, journals will become the ultimate repository. Uh, they must continue to publish, um, you know, the best works in our field, but they have to remain current and relevant. And they must be dynamic, as I mentioned. They must be responsive to change, adaptable to current trends, must continue to hold relevance for readers of all age groups, you know, young and old, and all different backgrounds, as mentioned. Uh, impact. So most uh, most of us try to publish our, our work in the highest uh, impact journals as possible. These are just some of the impact factors for the Journal of Neurosurgery that I'll just leave on the screen for you to see. And I, I've been really pleased to see for our journals um, that they've all continued to rise over the years, which I'm very uh, grateful for, for the Journal of Neurosurgery. Uh, we do need neurosurgery journals. I'm going to conclude with that, but we likely don't need neurosurgery offices. So this was the office at um, in Charlottesville. I used to go there three or four times a year as editor-in-chief, but now the office is closed and it's closed because everybody is working from home. We learned from the pandemic, everybody in this field, this space of publications and the publishing world, they can all work from home and they love working from home and they do a great job working from home. So in this instance, and I think it's true for a lot of the publication world, um, it's all virtual now. So our office is closed and um, it's no longer in existence. It's a virtual office. And I think that's uh, that was the right decision at the right time and something that we learned uh, having coursed through the pandemic. So with that, I'll close. And thank you very much, John, again, for this invitation to be the Bhatia lecture this year. Yeah, Roberto. One is the publications. And you heard about that. The second one is conflict of interest. Uh, is it enough just to acknowledge at the end that you have a great practice to become almost like a badge of honor if you have a long list of conflict yeah. at the end? Uh, so how do you feel about that? Is it yeah. Third publication conflict yeah. Um, thanks, Roberto. Those are excellent questions. I, I neglected to uh, speak to those. But multi-authored, um, I have a colleague, um, who just left Sick Kids Hospital, Michael Taylor. Some of you may know his name. He was very generous with his um, offering of authorship to anybody who contributed a specimen. Like he does molecular biology of brain tumors. He's published some of the best work in the highest impact journals like Nature and Science and and uh, and PNAS and others. And he he said, okay, you, you submitted a tumor specimen to me. I'll do the analysis, but I'll include you on the authorship. That was his view. Like, I don't know if that's enough, to be honest. That's my view. But if you look at his articles, he has 50 to 100 authors, but they're mostly individuals who submitted a, spe a specimen for analysis. Uh, I would take issue with that, actually. And, you know, I've, I've challenged him on that, but he, he he's very generous with that. But is that a real contribution? I think it adds to the paper. No question about that. But and each of the individuals has a chance to see the paper before it's published and so on and can make recommendations. But you know how it goes with 50 people on a paper. You're not likely to get their opinions uh, back in, in any meaningful way. So multi-author, yeah, we we watch. We actually have a limit that's it's loose for the journal neurosurgery. If it's more than 20, we really ask questions about it. Um, but uh, 
sometimes we've we've bent the rules if there's more than 20 but we want a good reason and it's the, it's the clinical trials that are like multi-center where you you want to have lots of authors i think be recognized so th that's where we might run into some issues and then the question about conflict of interest i think that mostly affects but not exclusively the spine world and so we have spine colleagues here so alan levy and others who might be in this room uh, i don't know if mike wang is here but yeah we we see their list of potential conflicts they're huge and um, can you really be unbiased um with all those um you know uh contacts with industry uh they they acknowledge them at least and and certainly the reviewers on the editorial board when they see that there's industry sponsorship of a given study like a scientific study in particular all the flags go up and then uh, those articles are really teased apart be before they would become accepted when there's industry sponsoring or funding of a, of a given um you know uh, research adventure so alan do you have any comments about about that i i agree i essentially i'm not smart enough to have those affiliations so <laughs> i i that's that's my my reason for it but i i was gonna have, say I, and I agree with what you said. I was going to say, into in addition to all the accolades that John uh, said about you, um, you, you know, you, you are one of the nicest <laughs> gentlemen in in neurosurgery. You never lose your cool. I've never seen. I, but I do have to say, once when I was a PGY two and you were a PGY seven, <laughs> I remember daughter Dr. Tatter getting upset at you because you did raise your voice a little bit to one of the ICU nurses and that's stuck in my head and I thought I would bring that up again no, my, my question is this you, you you brought up the the AI in terms of searching reviewers but I, you know as you said the the review process or being a reviewer is thankless it takes a lot of time yeah. you don't get credit for it with, in the promotion process you, you know you could review a thousand papers a day and it's unless you publish a paper or you're a section editor you, you just don't get credit for it and even if you're as smart as dr marcos and know the field you, you don't know everything i mean the field is hugely vast so you know i just wonder isn't there a role for AI in the review process. I, I know you incorporate a little bit of that to look and see if there's any duplication of content in a paper to previous papers, but like <clears throat> only a computer would really understand the depth of the field, what's really novel, and most importantly, wouldn't have any preconceived biases, which I, I still think is a big problem of the review process. Yeah, Th thanks, those are great points, Alan. Uh, what I did mention is that all the manuscripts that get accepted to the journal go through a program uh, that's called Authenticate, which checks for plagiarism or overlap um, in the world literature. So when we see an overlap of 30 percent, that, that um, comes to our attention and we, we recognize that there's there could be large portions of other manuscripts lifted from a prior publication into the present publication that then um, indicates that there's uh, copying and pasting of of effort. Um, now, the methods, like some sometimes there's only one way to, to write the methods, and I, I'm okay with if it's in the methods section, but if it's in the uh, introduction or the discussion in particular as overlap, like word for word, that's plagiarism, and uh, we call the authors out, and every manuscript goes through that, so we do assess that. That's a little bit of AI that's being used. Um, but in terms of doing the actual scientific analysis with AI, that's to come yet. I don't think we're there just yet, but it's probably going to come. Yeah, I saw a question back here. Yeah, Shock. Good. Thanks. You too. Um, has anybody looked at um, how many papers that had originally been rejected turned out to actually be uh, very impactful? Like, you know, you go around... Vinko Dolling is apparently very proud of the rejection of his transcavernous approach letter. He has it, I think it's, I don't know where, JNS or back in the early 80s. Yeah. And you hear those stories. I spoke to Hakuba. It'd be very interesting to go back and figure, I don't know how you get it, but figure out, you know, because the, the idea sometimes is so novel that the reviewers are for, we're human. You, you say, what is that nonsense? You know? Just, yeah, no, no, it's a really I, I good point. how much of that exists there. It's rejected then turns out to be completely yeah what we have that i can tell you is we've looked at manuscripts that have been rejected from journal of neurosurgery and where did they go afterwards like where do they finally see the light of day and get published so we've done that analysis and we've looked at 
how they bounce around. And as I mentioned, if you want your work published, you'll get it published. I mean, no doubt about it. There's so many journals out there you can right. choose from. But your question about the impact of like great articles that were snubbed by one journal right. before appearing in the other that changed the field, that would be a really good study and uh, be interesting to see how how prevalent that is. I, I I don't know the answer to that, but it'd be really, I know myself, I've had tons of rejections and eventually they saw the light of day, but um, but actually um, none of them had the high impact that you're talking about. And, sorry, a quick, quick follow-up. Somebody should do a study. Why is it that Canadians are ruling the publishing world between <laughs> Caldwell and you and Dom, Dom Dolka? What's going on? Yeah, no, no comment on that one. <laughs> yes. Great, Bobby. great talk, uh, Dr. Roca. I guess another question I had, I remember when Dr. Jane asked, you know, for a view on anti-plagiarism software, but looking at anti-GPT software, anti-AI software, I mean, now, you know, I was talking to some high school students that say, you know, their stuff is run through anti-GPT software, so they're, they're not, they're actually doing their homework or, the, or their college essays. I think this is going to be a, this, we're just scratching the surface here. I think the anti, I just showed you how powerful the GPT can be. And uh, we we need to be aware that things are going to be submitted now that have, have not been written necessarily by the individual submitting, that it's going to be a formulation that came out of a computer. And I think uh, you'll be able to detect that with some of the plagiarism software um, that, that are, that's currently in existence. And, and I think where GPT fails is it can't go into the libraries. I talked about going into the digital libraries at your university and institutions, scrolling the, the literature, because a lot of the, the literature is actually um, either protected, it's not open access, or you need a password to get in to get you know a PDF. So GPT can't get there yet, but when it does, watch out. But for the moment, it's not able to get all that information that's embedded in, you know, the libraries, it gets stuff from the internet, right? And for whatever that's worth, some of it's going to be good, but some of it's not going to be so, so strong. But once it gets into the library system and everything is published open access, that's when it, I think it's really going to get messy. I'm not sure how we're going to solve that one. Okay. Just thank I want to thank you again for uh, honoring Sanjeev's memory by being with us today and, uh, and for a wonderful talk. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my honor to present uh, at our grand rounds this morning, and uh, uh, thank you also, Dr. Rutka, for this great talk um, that preceded. So I'm going to present some of the work that I did as a resident at UCLA, looking at the role of this uh, unique protein called NYS01 as a potential novel target for immunotherapy for uh, malignant meningiomas. And uh, the work was really done under the uh, mentorship of uh, the Brain Tumor Research Group at UCLA, led by uh, Dr. Linda Liao, uh, Rob Prince, and others. Um, just wanted to first acknowledge that, you know, it's been a great year so far. I've learned a lot from um, colleagues and mentors, Dr. Morcos, as well as um, other faculty here at uh, UM and Pretty much the whole department has been very welcoming, and uh, it's it's a great environment. Um, so I've been fortunate uh, to have found uh, since probably PGY three year in residency a uh, disease that is both my research and clinical uh, uh, research uh, interest, and that is meningioma. And um, this is part part of the reason why uh, I'm doing this fellowship is so that I can be a good surgeon and a scientist to treat this disease. And uh, just some disclosures, these are the grants uh, that supported the research that I did. So quick introduction, brief background from meningiomas. We know that it's the most common adult primary brain tumors. Over 38% of all primary CNS tumors in adults are meningiomas. And uh, in the United States, 170,000 uh, patients have been diagnosed with meningiomas. And while the majority of patients with meningiomas have pretty benign course where surgery can be curable, uh, a subset are actually clinically fairly aggressive and the majority of them are in grade two and grade three meningioma tumors. The five and 10 year survival rates are listed here. You can see that for many of these, surgery cannot cure the disease. And the non-surgical options right now are fairly limited. 
for example, radio surgery and radio, radiation therapy can be used for unresectable tumors or recurrent tumors, or if there's residual tumor that's likely to recur, then oftentimes radiation is what's recommended. But unfortunately, right now, there's no FDA-approved adjuvant therapy. And we know that meningioma is mostly resistant to the existing chemotherapies and even many of the targeted therapies as well. And certainly right now, there's no approved immunotherapy for meningiomas. And um, people have really, over the last decade or so, started looking at, um, is there a role for immunotherapy for meningiomas? And just a couple of the reasons here listed um, suggest that we should look into it. For example, um, checkpoint molecules such as pdl one expression is elevated in high-grade meningiomas. And we know that you know, checkpoint inhibitors um, such as you know, pembrolizumab has had some efficacy for melanomas or sarcomas. Um, additionally, high-grade meningiomas have a higher somatic mutation burden. And we know from the literature for systemic cancers that um, high mutation burden tumors tend to respond better to immunotherapy. And this is also the case actually for gliomas as well. Um, so clearly meningioma needs immunotherapy given there's, uh, there's not any right now. And historically, I really think that it's the lack of novel antigen targets that been, that's been identified that's hindered its development. Um, just to illustrate this idea here. So uh, this paper uh, published by the Boston Group in Nature Communications last year was one of the bigger uh, papers that's published you know, with a higher impact. And they looked at 24 patients with high-grade meningiomas, uh, three of whom had grade three meningiomas and 21 had grade two meningiomas. And uh, they tried pembrolizumab in recurrent uh, and residual uh, meningioma patients. And basically they found that the median overall survival was 7.6 months. Um, they were not able to compare it to any kind of comparable historical control, but you can see that even with this uh, aggressive treatment with a known existing immunotherapy, uh, the outcome is not great. So if you look at the landscape of what's currently being done for meningioma immunotherapy, pretty much every single trial right now is a different combination of checkpoint inhibitor plus radiation. So there's no real other targets being investigated right now, at least that's registered. And so uh, our group wanted to try something different. And uh, we believe that NYS01 could be a novel target for meningioma immunotherapy. So what does it stand for? It stands for New York Esophageal Squamous Cell Carcinoma 1. Um, this was a patient uh, with this cancer that they identified, uh, they, the, that they first identified the patient, uh, protein in. And a uh, Hopkins group back in 2013 first published this data it, looking at its expression in meningiomas and found that uh, NYS01 expression, it correlated positively with tumor grade as well as its recurrent status. And what they found is basically higher grade tumors had higher expression of NYS01 and recurrent tumors had higher expression of NYS01, suggesting that Patients with the aggressive tumors are more likely to benefit from NYSO targeted immunotherapy because of the higher expression in those tumors. And so just to dive in a little bit into the, uh, the basics of NYSO. So its gene name is CTAG1B. And the gene name basically is a reflection of the fact that NYSO1 is a member of a group of proteins known as cancer testis antigen. And so cancer test antigens are basically as a whole expressed only in germ cells, but silenced in somatic cells. And uh, these proteins do get abnormally reactivated in cancer cells, therefore making them potentially ideal targets for immunotherapy because if successful, the immunotherapy would have very minimal um, on-target off-tumor effects because the target is not expressed anywhere outside the cancer. NYESO was also found to be mo the most frequently expressed CTA meningiomas by the Hopkins group. They found expression in 108 out of 110 samples, and they found that 63% had moderate to strong staining. And more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, the matched recurrent tum tumors had greater intensity of staining than the original primary tumor counterparts. 
So NYISO actually in kind of the systemic immunotherapy world uh, is uh, more well known. If you just Google kind of clinicaltrials.gov, you can see that there's currently already 151 immunotherapy trials registered for targeting metastatic melanoma, sarcoma, and lung cancer, et cetera. And so there's already some data out there demonstrating its efficacy, which I'll go into in a little bit. So what are the types of immunotherapies that can target NYISO? Broadly speaking, there are two categories. One is vaccines, and the other one is adoptive T-cell therapy. So vaccines, um, peptides, proteins, or uh, peptide post-dendritic cells, these unfortunately thus far have not shown as promising results as compared to adoptive T-cell therapies, which are a lot more promising. And I'll go into a little bit later, but uh, to target it with a T-cell therapy, one has to use engineered TCR transduced T-cells as opposed to CAR T-cells, which are a little bit more well-known. And in some of the early clinical trial uh, data that's been published, uh, patients uh, that received the therapy, more than 50% of them had some form of clinical response and the toxicity profile is minimal. So the question really that I had uh, going into looking at the role of NYISO in, in, in meningioma was, can we develop an effective therapy to target NYISO for this tumor? So the first thing we wanted to do was to really find out, is it worth looking into at all? So we needed to validate the Hopkins group's findings first to see what is the expression of NYISO in meningiomas. And if we are also able to confirm that the higher grade tumors have high expressions, and this will play into patient selections because really, if someone has a grade one meningioma that can be surgically cured, they don't need immunotherapy. But it's really the patients with the high grade tumors that are clinically aggressive where surgery cannot cure them that they need it. So we need to confirm that as well. Um, first, we collaborate with our European colleagues uh, in Germany and France who uh, looked at a cohort of 42 uh, meningioma samples and performed immunohistochemistry to stain for NYISO. And the uh, samples were you know, categorized as grade one, two, and three and by NF2 status. And here's the uh, data graphed out. The takeaway from this data is basically, if you look at going from low grade to high grade, you are more likely to find a NYISO expressing tumor as you go from grade one to grade three. And also among the high grade tumors, the NF2 mutants are more likely to have a high NYISO expression. But let's really look at the data that, um, the, the data that I got at UCLA. So we stained 35 tumor samples from UCLA with uh, immunohistochemical staining for NYISO. And here are some of the representative uh, pictures from each grade. The red color is NYISO, blue is uh, nuclei staining. And when we quantified each tumor sample by the percentage of tumor cells that express NYISO, we found a statistically significant positive correlation between that percentage and tumor grade, meaning that the high grade tumors had high expression, again, confirming that patients with the aggressive tumors could potentially benefit from ESO-targeted immunotherapy. Interestingly, when we then categorized and stratified by nuclear NYSO expression and correlated that with overall, sorry, progression-free survival, we found that those with high nuclear expression of NYSO had much worse progression-free survival, meaning patients were, this really suggested that patients with tumors that are more likely to recur were more likely to actually benefit from NYSO-targeted immunotherapy. So second thing is, a uh, question that we asked was, can we kill these cells at least in vitro by targeting NYISO using, using these TCR transduced T cells? And what is the exact efficacy? So how do we target NYISO? Just a little bit of mechanism uh, explained here. So NYISO is an intracellular express protein, meaning that in order for it to be detected by T cells, it has to undergo antigen presentation by MHC molecules and then be recognized by the T-cell receptors. Therefore, this can really only be targeted by engineered TCR T-cells rather than CAR-Ts, as I mentioned before. Um, there are various forms of engineered TCR T-cells targeting NYISO-1, but the one we used was originally developed at the NIH uh, right around 2011, 2012. 
And we, our group actually previously found that um, though gliomas in general don't express in way, so if you somehow make the glioblastoma cells express in way, so um, that using these TCR transduced T cells can cause in vitro significant cytolysis of the glioma cells. And then in vivo can definitely confer survival benefit in mouse xenograft glioma models when these TCR T cells are given through you know, IV systemic adopted cell transfer methods. And these TCR T cells can be really easily made in the laboratory using double transduction with retroviral vector. And um, the one that we used had a HLA 82.1 class one restriction element as well. Over time in culture, these skew to an CD8 positive population, meaning the majority of these T cells when administered are the cytotoxic killer T cells. So the central hypothesis that we had was that engineered TCR T cells can mount a cytotoxic anti-tumor response in easo-expressing meningiomas with the greater efficacy in the high-grade tumors that potentially would have high NYSO expression. And so the uh, data that I'll show you later on for in vitro assay are usually done by uh, this system that we used, which allowed for real-time assessment of T cell killing. Um, just a brief kind of physics slide here. Um, when you plate meningioma cells on a culture plate, they form an appearing monoculture layer. And these plates have gold contacts on the bottom and the machine can measure electron flow. When cells attach, the flow impedance is increased. When the cells die after the T cells kill them, they detach and the impedance decrease. And basically that raw data can be read by the machine in real time as many times as you want, every minute if you wanted to. And we can then use math to calculate how well the T cells are killing these meningioma cells in real time and graph out the speed of killing, so to speak. So what did we find? First, we tried it in the low ESO expressing meningioma cell lines. Uh, grade one, primary culture that we established from the OR. And uh, even in a low grade one primary culture, when we gave NYSO TCR T cells as a co-culture, we found that after just 10 hours, there is 20% uh, killing of these cells. And it's not a dramatic effect, but it's a clear effect. And this is similarly seen in another grade one meningioma, SF1335, originally developed at UCSF. And also around 10 hours, you see 20% cytolysis in the NYSO treated cohort. And what happens if you look at a grade two meningioma, but also has a low NYSO expression? Well, uh, you know, as you would expect, grade alone doesn't make it more likely to be targeted. It's the easy expression. So also around 10 hours, you get 20% cytolysis. Uh, so what happens when we treat a high easel expressed meningioma in a high grade tumor? CH057 is a pretty well established grade three meningioma. It's an NF2 mutant. And it turns out to have very high NYSO expression as shown here in Western blood and uh, PCR data. Um, CH157 natively does not have HLA 2.1. And so we had to transduce the A2.1 into the CH157 here, 98% uh, transduction. And when we then co-cultured the CH157 HLA 2.1 with the T cells, we saw a much more efficient killing of these tumor cells by the TCR T cells, over 60% at just 10 hours. Uh, as a negative control, as you can see here, the native CH157, despite the high NYSO expression, does not get killed because um, the TCR has a HLA 2.1 restriction element. So what happens when we increase the ratio of T cells to meningioma cells in a cold culture? As you would expect, it kills the meningioma cells faster. And what happens when we extend the cold culture to the past 24 hours, you can see here, by day one, 24 hours, the killing approaches almost asymptotic, asymptotically to 100%. So then we ask, does it work in an animal model in vivo? Can we prolong survival by treating these animals with meningiomas using adoptive cell transfer systemically? So here's the model that we used. Uh, the background animal is the NSG mice. Uh, for those of you 
not familiar with NSG mice, uh, these are Im extremely immunodeficient. They lack uh, B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells, which allow us to implant human meningeal cell lines into their brain and allow it to grow. And so four days after tumor implantation, uh, we would give through IV tail vein injection, the T cells in the control group, they'll get the control T cells and the experimental group would get the NYSO T cell transduced T cells. And then the T cell expansion will be supported by intraperitoneal injection of IL-2 for three days. And then we measure overall survival. So when the animals die, we harvest their brains and here's a coronal section of mouse brain harboring the large CH157 xenograft meningioma. Here, it almost looks like it's a perisagittal meningioma, so to speak. And uh, we also intentionally looked at uh, the an uh, animal brains four days to five days after T cells were given, basically a few days after the T cells have been given a chance to get into the body and perhaps surround the tumor. We want to see if there's evidence that the T cells actually got to the tumor and how much have they infiltrated the tumor. And red is NYESO, green is CD8, yellow CD3. And you can see that the T cells seem to have surrounded the small tumors that have formed uh, early on in our experiment. So here's the survival data. Here's one experiment. Uh, when you compare the in the red line, TCR transduced T cell treatment to the blue line, which is a controlled T cell treatment, you can see that there's some modest improvement in overall survival, uh, but statistically significant improvement in overall survival. And, um, and remember, this is a grade three meningioma cell line that's very malignant. And here is another experiment that we uh, did where we saw a, a slightly improved, a more dramatic effect of uh, uh, median survival of you know, 30% improvement. So here's sort of the preliminary conclusions that we can make. You know, we think that meningiomas could benefit from you know, immunotherapy and that T cell transduced C cells could induce NYSO specific cytolysis in meningiomas in vitro with greater efficacy in high NYSO expression meningiomas. We also think that systemic adoptive cell transfer T cell transduced C cells may extend overall survival, at least in animal models, bearing intracranial meningiomas in vitro, uh, sorry, in vivo. And finally, we think that targeting NYSO may be a clinically feasible immunotherapeutic strategy to treat high-grade aggressive meningiomas. So what can we do next? I think that given what's been done already in the melanoma and sarcoma uh, world, uh, we can easily translate our finding to, you know, clinical trials, um, enrolling patients in early phase zero one clinical trials. I think safety and efficacy is expected to be low given that it's been tried in melanoma and sarcoma patients already. And that the key is really to identify patients with these aggressive meningiomas and uh, making sure that they have high NYSO expression. They are HLA 82.1, which is found in about 40% of the North American population. Uh, and enroll them to see what is the efficacy. And also trying to see what if it's someone who may not fit that initial screening criteria. So check, checkpoint inhibitors, which I mentioned before, um, obviously it's been known to overcome immunosuppressive microenvironment. It's also been true that in melanoma patients, they found that when pembrolizumab was given, that even the native CDA positive anti NYSO T cells were able to expand and function better. And so you can imagine that in some patients with high NYSO expression, but with an immunosuppressive microenvironment, tumor microenvironment, that this TCR T cells by itself may not work as well. But if you give it in combination with permalizumab, it could increase the efficacy. And on the other hand, you can have a patient with a grade three tumor that's aggressive, but has low NYSO expression, what do you do with that? So uh, hypomethylating agents in general are known to upregulate certain cancer protein expression. The cytopene we found has been able to significantly increase NYSO expression initially in gliomas, but um, I have preliminary data showing that in meningema cell lines, at least, they're able to rapidly upregulate NYSO expression. And 
Dicitabine already by itself is an FDA-approved adjuvant therapy for systemic cancers, and also been known to have synergistic effects with radiation treatments, which many of the recurrent meningioma patients do get anyway. And so it would, it would potentially be a perfect combinatorial drug, so to speak, to augment the effects of NYSO targeted therapy. And um, here's some more data looking at the cytomines effect on meningiomas in culture. You can see that for all these, obviously we use the grade one meningioma uh, to, to start out, but tumors with low NYSO expression after even just 48 hours of treatment with the uh, cytomine can significantly upregulate their NYSO expression. And also interestingly, when we looked at um, the effect of decidabine on uh, cancer gene expression in general, we found that meningiomas in particular upregulate NYSO1 more than any other cancer-related genes in a panel of 700 genes in this nanostring pan-cancer immunotherapy panel. So uh, what about functional effects of decidamine treatment. So at baseline, you've seen this data already. 20% uh, psychosis after 10 hours of cold culture in a low NYSO expression meningioma cell line. When we pre-treat these tumor cells with decidamine and then add the ESO TCRs, you can see the effect is increased significantly. And so uh, additionally, in the glioma models that we, um, our lab looked at before, when the animals were, uh, tumors were pre-treated with, uh, with the cytobine, the overall survival was significantly increased when uh, ESA was given compared to when no decidabine was given. And so really the question that we wanna ask for our next step of experiments is really, can decidabine further enhance the survival benefits of systemic adoptive cell transfer of TCR T cells for meningiomas? And then this is something that's interesting um, that came out of our, you know, survival, clinical survival data, looking at the nuclear NYSO expression. So uh, in general, unfortunately, the role of NYSO expression in uh, normal physiology is not as well understood. People do not, uh, do know that, you know, uh, NYSO is pretty uh, important for general cell survival, but uh, perhaps it's important during development as well. Um, we don't have good mouse models to study NYSO because actually NYSO gene is only expressed in humans and not in mice. So uh, regardless, uh, in the head and neck cancer literature, people have found that uh, patients with tumors that had simultaneous cyt cytoplasmic and nuclear NYSO expression had much poorer survival than those that only had either. And so what we found in the meningioma uh, samples that we looked at was that there was also a positive correlation between nuclear expression and tumor grade. And so the questions that we really wanted to ask was, is there a higher nuclear expression in meningioma stem cells? We know that high meningioma tumors, high grade meningioma tumors uh, have been known to have uh, populations of stem cells or stem-like cells in them. And then also do these TCRs target in meningioma cells with high nuclear expression more effectively than meningiomas that have lower nuclear expression. So these are some of the questions that we can ask in the future. And uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in the brain tumor group that helped me to get this project uh, completed. And, uh, and I want to thank my mentors, Dr. Everson, Dr. Leo, and Dr. Prince, and of course, Dr. Morcos this year for helping me as well. Thank you so much. Great work. Matt is uh, joining UT Southwestern, and uh, I think you need a bunch of other many applicants for that job. Lectures, units, wonderful. You're going to carry on that wonderful work as a mission scientist, neurosurgeon, and great work. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I understood your talk, but but I, just a naive question. If, um, if you enhance the immune response to this tumor in a patient that has a mass that can't be resected, aren't you going to expect to make them deathly ill from the inflammatory reaction? Uh, how, how are you going to manage that when you bring this to the yeah. side? So we don't know. Uh, we, obviously, uh, we obviously don't know the uh, local um, sort of uh, inflammatory response 
within the CNS because no one's tried it in any sort of brain tumor setting yet. But in the setting of systemic cancers, uh, obviously patients in those trials do not have brain metastases. Melanoma patients, sarcoma patients, they don't get the uh, crazy inflammatory response that one would typically see with the CAR T cells actually, because CAR T cells are sort of really powerful um, T cell therapies compared to TCRs, which are a little bit more specific and it requires a little bit more downstream signaling as well. Um, the other question that I had was, you know, if, if this if this uh, uh, protein is only expressed in the testes, do patients get urologic complications, uh, or especially male patients? And uh, the answer is no, they have not found that. In fact, the only toxicities observed in those early clinical trials were actually a, a toxicity associated with uh, other chemotherapies that were given in conjunction with the uh, immunotherapy. So neutropenia, for example, sometimes uh, when they're given in between doses of TCR. But yes, it'd be, sorry, it'd be good to know what would happen when you know in the brain with the local infl inflammatory profiles. Yeah, thank you. It was a great uh, presentation. I enjoyed it. Please give Linda my best. And it's, it's wonderful. She's always thinking outside the box, especially for tough tumors like uh, meningiomas, high grade. Uh, definitely need help in this uh, in this field. <clears throat> uh, two questions. One was um, the cancer testis antigen family is big, right? And yeah. you uh, focused on one um, member of that family. Uh, the other members have no role to play in this, uh, or would it be conceivable to, you know, maybe synergize with other members of this family if they're also elevated in, in, um, in treatments after just cytobine or something like yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, two answers to your question. One is, uh, yes, actually, one of the, one of the things that excited me about, uh, I guess, UT Southwestern is that they have um, many of the well-known cancer testing antigen experts there. Um, but uh, when the Hopkins group first looked at uh, all cancer tested antigen expression in meningiomas, they found that NYSO was the most frequently expressed um, by a large margin, but it does not mean that the other tumors didn't have uh, any um, of the other cancer tested antigens there. So I think the prevalence of some of the, uh, like let's say number two and number three candidate in the family is probably somewhere around 15 to 20% of the tumors expressed it compared to NYESO. So yes, I think there is a role. Um, if I have the time and resources, definitely I will look into that and synergistic effect as well. Um, the, uh, this, I, sorry, I forget the second part of my response. <clears throat> so my yeah. second question was related to uh, getting NYESO expressed after decidabine treatment, which is really yeah. interesting. Uh, is that just specific to meningioma, or is, is that a response you see with the cytobine in lots of different cancers? Like, would, would that happen? Yes, in it's gliomas it's, and other types. It's it's in it's in many different cancers, and um, its effect may be slightly different in different cancers. For example, even comparing gliomas to meningiomas is slightly different. Um, in meningiomas, certainly in that gene panel, we found that. So for some reason, NYESO was the most upregulated gene after designing treatment out of 700 cancer genes. Um, people have definitely used uh, decidabine in conjunction with many other types of immunotherapy, including checkpoint inhibitors, um, as, as an adjunct. And um, so, yeah, so it's definitely something that would be helpful. Great talk, Matt. Um, uh, I think it's very interesting. I think promising work to kind of for malignant meningiomas that really aren't surgical candidates, you know, these patients with disseminated disease. I guess my question is um, meningiomas really aren't immune, you know, they're not immune privileged like the brain. You know, we have, we know now like recent papers the last two years that there's like in, interesting like antigen presentation in the meningeal surface, especially around the sinuses. Why aren't this, why isn't NYE so, you know, seen, you know, naively without this, you know, in, in, in humans, for example, are, are our T cells like, not primed to seeing this antigen? Yeah, I think that in some of the high-grade meningiomas, uh, the antigen presentation may be similar to some of the high-grade gliomas as well in that um, antigen presentation may be inhibited. And we may be, again, you know, I don't want to over-interpret my data. I don't know if CH157 is one of those tumors that have high expression and high antigen presentation. And so... Uh, it will be interesting to also when we enroll patients in trials to see, you know, what is their antigen presentation level in general so that they can 
you know, be better recipients of this therapy. And then my, my follow-up question is um, how do you, how do you like plan to like translate this to humans, you know, immunotherapy, you know, in general for meningiomas and like these, you know, phase one, two trials, um, I think out of Dana Farber have really all failed. You know, they had that recent paper in yeah. neuro-oncology last year that really showed no improvement at all. Um, and we see these patients who, you know, essentially after two months, they still have progression with malignant grade three. So, I mean, do you plan on local delivery, you know, um, intra-arterial versus, you know, just systemic? I, I'm just curious if you've thought about that. Yeah, um, my, I, I think, so one is that I think uh, for patients who have had their fourth or fifth meningioma resected and have no other options, um, for the individual patients, uh, there's absolutely probably a great deal of desire to be enrolled in some form of clinical trial. So I think if the patient is being taken care of you by within your institution, I think the willingness is I would expect to be there. And then um, the second part of the question is uh, sort of, sorry, can you repeat the second part of the question? No, just in terms of local delivery. Like, yeah. How do you plan on you know, changing delivery method? I mean, the IV you know, Pembro trials to me don't seem to be working. Um, so interestingly for the uh, adoptive T-cell therapy, the data that we have right now in the glioma model that we had, at least in mice, is that IV systemic adoptive cell transfer is superior to local intratumoral injection. Um, so uh, we don't know exactly why, even though um, th you would imagine that uh, intratumoral injection would directly put the T cells in there, but perhaps they would be within a much more immunosuppressive microenvironment within the tumor than within the body. And what people have found, or what we, what our group found too, is that when you give it systemically, uh, the T cells also can be found elsewhere in the brain much more diffusely than, uh, you know, when you do intratumoral tumor injection. So you can see it, uh, at least in the glioma models, in the contralateral hemisphere when you give it through the vein as opposed to intratumoral injection. And so perhaps um, that broader regional uh, effect can uh, can be a better, uh, can have better efficacy. In the yoma, you said that many yomas are immunologic so They're not. They're not. So I was like, I was curious why why they're not why we don't have a naive response like you know without without finding anything. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, you know, I think I think people started looking at kind of the expression of um, checkpoint molecules. That would be like one reason why maybe you don't have a native response in addition to, you know, lack of antigen presentation. Yeah. And then last, just because we have time, you want to discuss maybe your job, how you're going to set it up. Are you going to do like uh, have a lab and protect the time? Or are you planning to do more trialist work? How to, like just for the residents so that maybe, you know. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I'll have a lab. Um, I'll have protected time. Uh, it's 50% clinical effort. Um, I guess forty five percent research and five percent teaching, and um, I'm hoping to collaborate also with the PhD scientists to, um, you know, basically, you know, when you're first starting out a lab, not only do you need to build the, your own lab's infrastructure, but also try to, you know, um, depend on the genera generosity of your collaborators, piggyback on their infrastructure to get you know as productive as fast as possible, and um, you know, I th I've been lucky to have many good mentors uh, to have worked with many teams. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of research success is 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 luck because everyone works hard, especially in neurosurgery. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.